we'll get it on. I'm sure things will work out. There we go. There we go. Now you got to listen. So, Once again, anybody glad to be out in the house of the Lord on Wednesday night? It's a good crowd for Wednesday night. Really, it, it is. And we're here to praise the Lord, to give him the glory for all of the things he's done. When I was a little boy growing up, we used to have what we called popcorn meetings. And people would jump up and they'd testify and they'd just tell what God had done for them and how much he'd blessed them. And that blessing would spill out on somebody else and that would spill out on somebody else before you know it. You had popcorn going, you know. And I really miss those days. But tonight we're going to worship him and praise him. We're going to sing together an old song out of the hymnal called At the Cross, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. Join with us as we sing together. burdens of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day that first verse every time that I sing that I think of Charles Stanley y'all heard of Charles Stanley right and I remember he was preaching one day and he used this song as an example and he used that part there he said he said years ago when he was a kid, he said that it didn't say some of the things. He said, for a worm such as I. He, he gave his life for a worm such as I. And he said, then they changed it to a wretch son as I, uh, such as I. And then he changed it to as a sinner such as I. And he said, but you know what? When I came to the Lord, I was just lower than an old worm. And God reached down and he took that worm out of the ground and he cleaned me up and he made me a fit subject for the kingdom of God. You know, you can change the word, but it's still the work of God in our lives that makes the difference. Join as we sing the second verse. It was for crimes that I had done. He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day but drops of grief can never repay the debt of love i owe dear lord i give myself cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. I am so glad for the work that was accomplished there on the cross of Calvary. Aren't you? You know if it wasn't for the cross today we would have no hope. But because Jesus was willing to go to the cross, I've often said, as he carried that old cross on his shoulders, I know that the weight of that cross had to be awful, considering that he had been beaten probably beyond recognition, had lost so much blood, his body was probably in physical shock. But I do believe that it was the sins of all the world that weighed heavier than that old cross. And he was willing to carry it for us. And to go all the way to the Calvary. And I love you'll never ever tell me that there is a song any better than this song that we're going to do right now. I thank God for that old rugged cross.
rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear prepare our hearts for prayer tonight I was thinking we were talking on our way up here the people that we have known that has went on before us and you know what it's because they've been able to hold on and they've been able to to, to maintain that standard that God has given us that one of these days we can meet them again one of these days we'll be able to see them face to face one of them day one of these days we will be able you think about this to hear Jesus himself well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. What a day that's going to be. And he deserves all of the praise, all of the glory, all of the honor for it all. He is my Lord today. He is my Redeemer. He is my Savior. But best of all, you know what? He's my friend. He loves me with an everlasting love. Join with us as we sing this little chorus before we go to prayer. It just simply says, I will praise him. I will praise him and praise the Lamb of God. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise Let's sing that one more time. Oh, I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give Him glory, all ye people, for His blood can wash away. We go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Uh, we want to remember uh, some needs that are part of our fellowship. Certainly, we want to continue to remember Lonnie Smith. Surgery went well, and uh, he may come home tomorrow. Is that right, uh, Wanda? Hopefully. And uh, then I learned that uh, Steve uh, Sowards had to go back to the hospital and needs a pacemaker. 
And uh, so we want to pray for him, and Marcy had one scheduled for tomorrow. So they're both getting pacemakers, his and hers, <laughs> uh, uh, edition, Thursday and Friday, St. Mary's Hospital. I don't know why they couldn't just put them side by side in the suite and let them have it that way, but uh, we want to pray for both of them. That's, uh, that's, that's tough to have to have it done that way. And uh, so let's lift them up. I understood from George McCormick that uh, our Medal of Honor uh, w winner uh, over in uh, Milton, his name is Woody, what's the last name? Williams. Williams, thank you. That came from a Williams, didn't it? Okay. All right. Woody Williams passed away this morning. And uh, we want to, I think we should just note that and recognize, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a giant oak that has fallen, you know, that uh, what a, I read some of the story of his heroism uh, just uh, on some of the plaques and whatnot. I've heard people talk about it and what a loss. Yes. Other prayer requests that you want to make known? They have, do they have it? And, and the Deermans also, uh, Pam and Larry also have that going on at their house. And we want to pray for them. That's why they weren't here Sunday, but they, they had it confirmed since then. Our vacation Bible school coming up. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Big deal. That's a big deal. That's a big evangelistic outreach to children in this community. And uh, be praying about uh, who you think the Lord ought to add to the list of helpers for that. Well, I would, I think that'd be great. You know, you think you're sick of it. <laughs> but she, uh, she does have a strep throat and double ear, severe double ear infection on top of everything else. Yeah, and she's been sick for two weeks like that. And they missed, well, I would say misdiagnosed. They diagnosed it differently the first week. So she's already been on antibiotics for a week and then came back sicker. And that's what they said this time. So uh, we would uh, appreciate that. So keep praying. For her and uh, let me just add one more personal one I don't do a, like to do a lot of that but my daughter Emily she was here last Sunday with her uh, husband and, and our granddaughter Elena and uh, she got laid off a couple weeks ago um, they closed they eliminated her job uh, with the organization that she was working in and she got called from the job she wants most actually even more, a better job than what she had for an interview Friday and uh, you know I just if you think about it, it would mean a lot to know that uh, she's got some prayer support. So make sure that she is her, her best self at that interview and can, you know, if she's the right person for the job that it shows in the interview, that'd be my, my prayer. So uh, anything else? trusting God for healing, 
he was hoping that he could get into the cancer center in Texas, but he said that he just doesn't believe that God is finished with him yet. And his name is Jimmy Barney. I would like the church to pray for Jimmy. He's a great guy. And it just seems like he's almost part of the family. He traveled with us so much. Jimmy Barney. Could we sing that uh, that chorus one more time? And you know, with all of these requests, it just seems like a heavy volume of them tonight. Maybe a number of us that feel that you could could come down around the altar or sit on the front pew. We get closer together and pray. And uh, and uh, I'm going to open with prayer. But uh, I would be pleased if two or three other people would want to join in also and lead in prayer, like we did the other night. Just take a few minutes so we make sure we cover them all, because nobody will remember all of those. And uh, we want to lift them all to the throne of grace. So why don't we come together as we sing, and uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. We'll praise Him. Father, we come to you in an atmosphere of praise and thanksgiving. We are thanking you, Lord, for answers to prayer and ways you have ministered to us in times past. We rejoice, Lord, in the fact that you answer prayer, that you're a very present help in a time of trouble. You're a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You're like a father to us. You're like a mother who gathers uh, her, her chicks around and carries, holds them under her wings. We're so thankful, Lord, for your constant abiding presence. We're so thankful that you're almighty, all-knowing, everywhere. But Lord, as big as you are, you're so small and so intimate that you know every detail of our lives. You know the prayer of our heart before we utter it. You know the hairs of our head. You know the days that are before us. Lord, you know all things, and yet, Lord, you love us. You loved us before we loved you. You loved us when we didn't love you. Your love is unbelievable. We don't understand it, Lord. We don't feel worthy of it, but we are grateful for it. And so, Lord, it's in this kind of faith and atmosphere that we come and bring these requests to you this evening. We pray, Lord, that you'd continue to work in the lives of these that have been mentioned. We probably won't be able to name them all, but Lord, if several of us lead and we pray together between all of us in this room, we will lift all of these needs and others to the throne of grace. And Lord, besides, we know you're not depending on us to name the name to remind you anyway. You already know what the needs are. It just pleases you, Lord, that we'd be specific about it. And Lord, we pray that you'd be with Marcy and Steve today and that Lord, you would help them as they're facing this uh, surgery uh, Lord, for these pacemakers, be with Steve as he lays in the hospital, Marcy as she waits, and Lord, we pray that this would all go well and that you'd bring them home safe and stabilized, and Lord, that they would have their needs met in every way. Lord, we thank you for Lonnie, and Lord, we believe that his being here this Sunday morning was no accident. We believe, Lord, you're at work in his heart, on his soul. And Lord, we don't know exactly where he is, but we believe he's a lot closer now than he was some time ago, and we give you thanks for that. We pray, Lord, that you administer to him body, mind, and spirit. Lord, we pray for uh, this friend that has stage four pancreatic cancer that Danny has mentioned, Lord, what a desperate, terrible diagnosis. We know what that diagnosis means. But Lord, you're able to open blind eyes. You're able to raise the dead. You're able to make the leper spots disappear. You're able to do exceeding abundant above all we could ask or think. 
And Lord, we pray for healing in his body. Lord, according to your plan for his life, we pray, Lord, for your will to be accomplished to your glory. And Lord, we believe that could be healing in his life. Lord, I thank you for these other needs that have been mentioned as we continue in prayer. We're just going to continue to lift them up as another person takes the lead in this prayer. We're continuing our prayer to the Lord. Father, have your way, we pray. who are grieving the loss of Woody Williams. Thank you, Lord, for his service to our country. Pray for K.J. Jordan and her husband watching over their pregnancy of his baby. Sheila unspoken needs all over our church. You are able to do exceeding abundant above all we could ask or think according to your power that's at work within us. Lord, I quote that scripture often because it builds my own faith because I know that if I can imagine it, if I can think it, Lord, I'm not thinking as big as you can accomplish. Lord, you have better things in store for us sometimes than even our requests. Lord, you know what we need and what we need most. And Lord, we yield our prayers to your hand and say, Lord, while we may think we know what we need, we surrender ourselves to you in such a way to allow you to reveal to us or even to just do for us according to our need. Lord, thank you for all the men and women in this service tonight. We know, Lord, that sometimes we come tired from work and from the cares of the uh, day and the week and Lord I pray you'd renew the strength of every person that's here and Lord we're grateful for a church that has a prayer meeting in the middle of the week Lord we know that we have wonderful things in store Lord as we walk with you faithfully as a church but Lord we know that prayer is the center of it and so Lord teach us to pray teach us to be faithful Lord have your way we pray in all of these things in Jesus name we pray amen i will praise him i will praise him praise the lamb for sinners slain give him glory all ye people for blood can wash away each day. And you know, I forgot to continue to pray for Bill Runyon and for his family also. As they've had that funeral, I guess, was today instead of yesterday. Am I right about that? They moved it. And uh, so we want to just continue to remember them as well. Never we ushers to come. We're going to receive our offering at this time. We'll invite them to do that now. Thank you so much for giving faithfully to the ministry of this church and for giving to the Lord. Father, bless the offering, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for faithful givers, tithers, cheerful givers. Lord, you have blessed us abundantly. We are so thankful, Lord. We give back to you an offering of praise. 
through our gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, ladies. Let's give them a round of applause. They don't get all the pray attention they ought to get for every week. Thank you for making our service better. Thank you very much. They don't do it for that, but once in a while it's appropriate to say thank you, isn't it? Uh, we appreciate that and all the things that people do to make our church uh, what it is. Take your Bibles with me. If Sorry, Brother Shank, I have a, just a blind spot there. Yes, sir. And do you want me to say what I think it is, or are you going to tell us what you think it is? Because I think I know what you're saying, but I'd rather you say it. I think it was highly questionable. <laughs> the fact that he ever got here for church is a miracle. Absolutely it is. In fact, that's why I couldn't stand it when I realized that was him sitting out in that wheelchair. I had to go out there and shake his hand. I want to shake hands for a miracle. <laughs> There's another miracle sitting right over there. Right by Tanner. May, so thankful for you. And did we have answers to prayer, don't we? Yeah. So, well, now, anybody else? I don't want to, I don't want to cut you off, but I, I uh, Wanted to be able to give this message if I can. John chapter 4, let's uh, look at it together. John 4, and there uh, going to be a couple of other passages of Scripture I'm going to look at too that are going to be similar in theme. Uh, John chapter 4, verse 35 through 38. Again, we're on this series on witnessing. And uh, here it says, do you, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored, others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. And then uh, there are some other passages that we're going to look to. We might want to put a finger in Matthew 9, 35 through 38. It just happens to be the same verses. In fact, let's just look at that together. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. In the passage in chapter 4 of the Gospel of John, Jesus had just had a life-changing experience with the woman at the well in Samaria. 
the disciples are absent. Uh, they come upon the scene and they are surprised to discover that Jesus has spoken with a woman, which was uh, something that just wasn't done, especially uh, alone and, and in that situation. Uh, and then you add to the fact that it was a Samaritan woman. It was kind of a shock to them that, that he would be doing that. The woman in the situation who had been uh, talking with Jesus, had been talking about faith and the difference between their religion in Samaria and, and, the, and what Jesus was preaching, and Jesus exposed her. He said, uh, you should go home and ask your, your husband about this, or she, or, or she said something about going home and asking her husband about it, and he, he said, uh, You've, you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. And uh, she was shocked that he knew all that about her. And uh, she was stunned. And you, you know that she got the, uh, she, through the course of the conversation, her life was changed. She went back to her village and she said, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? She's ecstatic over her conversation. The disciples are shocked over the conversation and their only concern is food. What are we having for our next meal? What are you going to eat? Make sure Jesus eats and takes care of himself. Jesus responds to that, that I have food you don't know anything about. My food is to do the will of the Father <laughs> and to see his work be accomplished. And then he says, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look. The fields are white unto harvest already. Um, I want us to look at the harvest just for a little while. We talk about witnessing. I want to think about who we're witnessing to. We've been talking about our responsibility to witness, but I want to talk about witnessing to someone and who it is, who it is that we're sharing with. Who is this harvest? And where is it the most, uh, where is the most fruitful part of the harvest? See the harvest. See it's white and ready to be harvested. I want us to look at it and uh, think about the potential for witness. I drew a circle around our church, seven miles, on a device that is available through research and uh, 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 there's a research uh, program on the uh, website for missions in the, in the Church of the Nazarene. By putting in our zip code, I could draw a circle any length of any miles I want to, and I get all kinds of information. I decided to do seven miles, which is approximately between here and just past the Taze Valley Church, and that brings us all the way around to Milton, around Milton, Taze Valley, and this whole area. And I learned from that drawing that circle that there are approximately 52,000 people living in this area. 52,000, if you add all the communities together, that are living in this area. And here's what shocks me. 66.3% of them are unclaimed by any church or any denomination. That's two-thirds. And this is kind of the Bible Belt, <laughs> in, in, a, in a way. And this is, this is what I would consider a, a, a very evangelized town. In fact, when I drive through Hurricane, I see people out with signs saying, you must be born again. I mean, it's, it's a different kind of town, but, but beyond this town, if you take in all of the rural areas around here, plus into Taze Valley and all the communities there, over 50,000 people, two-thirds of them are unclaimed by any church. I checked to see what the demographic was, to see what kind of bell curve might be on ages, and, and I discovered that, that this, unlike a lot of areas in West Virginia, is not only uh, has some growth going on in it, but, but this area is distributed age-wise, where about 20% of those are under 18. About 30% are between 18 and 44. About 30% are between 45 and 64, and about 20% are 64 and up. It's just amazing how that, that worked out. I, I, I'm not sure it's exactly a, 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 a fully balanced uh, bell, but it, but it shows that we have excellent distribution of ages. 35,000 approximately unclaimed people within a seven mile radius of this church. And you can scoff if you want, but I was thinking about it and praying about tonight and I thought, Lord, if we could just win 1% 
of these 35,000 people who are unclaimed by any, just 1%. That would be 350 people that would be added to this church. 350 people added to this church. The fields are white under harvest. I think we could, you, if we had a vision, if we had a, if we had a Christ-like vision, if we had a vision that was a Holy Spirit-empowered vision, we wouldn't say we'd go for 1%. But we would say from our standpoint, from the limited place of where we are, 1% would be huge to be able to reach 350 people. And I thought to myself, well, Lord, why couldn't we reach 350 unclaimed people over a five-year period of time so that we would find ourselves as a church? And you say, well, I don't know if I want to be a part of a church that big. Set that aside for a minute. But just say, what if our church was a church of 500 in about five years? That would be less than the 1% added because you have to account for the fact that people die and move away and things. So that's, that's, just, that's just for accounting for some of that. What if we experienced that kind of growth? That would be far less than what Jesus is talking about in the scriptures. And yet it would be a great faith goal achievement for us. If we had a church that size, we would be probably needing to think about what, how we we're going to accommodate that. We'd probably have to have the sanctuary that was envisioned before. We'd probably have to have some other things that, that would have to come along with that. Our ministries would have to expand. Our ability to accommodate disciple, we'd have to have more ports of entry. We'd have to have things like that going on. We might even have to think about the fact that the most effective way to reach all those people might be to have a satellite church over in Barbersville or something like that, or somewhere else that somewhere within a few miles of here where we to draw people from different areas. I don't know what it would look like. I'm just saying my goal is not necessarily to do it this way, this way, or this way, or to fill up this kind, or build this kind of, or do this kind of thing. My goal would be strictly to reach the 350 people, the 1% at a minimum of the people who are unclaimed. And I believe that if we had things going on, if we had a white hot church revival, and we had people witnessing everywhere effectively, that we could consider that 350 people might not be an aggressive enough goal but you'd have to you'd have to believe that it was spiritual you'd have to believe that God was involved because if we if we're if we're talking about what we can do in our own strength and we're talking about this, our human strategies and our human plans well then we better back, back it up and be a whole lot more modest about how quick we can build a, build a, the the system but but let me tell you he's able to take and sweep people into the kingdom he could do that and it would be the actual uh, fruit of a genuine revival that would come people are more responsible to Christ sometimes more than others. I'm talking about the harvest. Now, I've just given you some of the, some of the parameters of what's out there. But, but when are people most likely to respond, most likely to be receptive to a witness, receptive to an invitation to church, receptive to receiving Christ? There are some markers for that. For one, if they've gone through some kind of insecurity producing situation in their life. An insecurity producing situation in their life. That could take a number of forms. That could be a flood. That could be your roof lift rip, ripped off your head in a, uh, over your head uh, in a storm. That could be a fire. That could be a victim of a crime. That could be a death in the family. That could be losing your job or getting a new job or being a new resident or a new baby. It could be a serious illness. What if everybody in the capacity of their own relationships, when we became aware of somebody in a security uh, destabilizing situation, made that the focal point of making sure that the witness, and along with that witness, of course, you'd have to lead with care, and it would have to be genuinely that first. But we know that people are more responsive in those situations. Another thing that we can look for is people that begin to discuss spiritual things. So when people are around us and they are wondering, well, why are we here? And what is the meaning of life? And what, why do, what makes life meaningful? Or somebody's asking a, a, a spiritual question like, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why is it that good things sometimes happen to bad people? That's the one that bothers me sometimes even more. Ultimate concerns of life. Or perhaps... They show signs of moving towards God by asking very specific questions or noticing something 
spiritual or religious that interests them and they have a connection. Or maybe it's nostalgia for the way they grew up and they reminisce about the way it was when they went to church with grandma when they were a little child. And it seems to come from a faraway place. These are things that would help us to know that we would especially be able to zero in and, and help out. What if, what if we had a ministry that was designed specifically to really watch out for people who have had sudden insecurity producing circumstances in their lives and we provide a genuine care and interest? Not swooping in and saying, hey, do you know the four spiritual laws? But coming in there and, and helping them put their tarp on their roof. Or come in there and help them with, a, or, or send them a note and a card and said, you know, we're praying for you in your church. We have heard about this. And, and, and we just want you to know that we are here and you have been lifted in prayer. I mean, there's a whole variety of things that can be done. What if we had a whole church full of witnesses that were looking for every opportunity possible to make an impact in the life of somebody who was in these kinds of situations? I would say that it would be kind of like Jesus looking and he's healing the sick and, and he's feeding the hungry and he's doing these things and then he looks out and he says he, he he's his case filled with compassion and, and he says he, he says I, I just see that they're like sheep without a shepherd they they are so needy and that kind of concern the service uh, the, the 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 process of the harvest is another thing that we should think about and that is that, that these these images that we have of of these agricultural images that Jesus gives are about sowing, preparing soil, nurturing the ground, uh, watering, harvesting. That doesn't happen in one visit to the farm. It doesn't happen the first day you address the crop. That happens over a period of time. I think our expectations, although God can do it any way he chooses in any individual case, our expectations that, are, that, our, that our harvest is automatically going to happen just the first time we talk to somebody, and then if it doesn't happen, then we should just probably give up and go on from there, is, is kind of unreasonable. What people need is relationships and love. They're not even, even people that visit here are not looking for friendly churches. We are a very friendly church. They are looking for friends. There is a big difference between a friendly church and friends. A friend takes time with you beyond uh, just the greeting at the door. A friend makes room for you in their lives. And, and so people have needs. And, and when they're vulnerable and they feel alone, and they, there's a natural tendency to look for where there's security and love and support. And so we should see this as a process. The crop is sown. It, it is watered. And before the crop is even sown, the soil is prepared. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God gave the increase. That means that Apollos isn't anything and, and, and Paul isn't anything. God is the one that gets the glory, but we get to participate in the harvest. But it's a process. He said, I planted the seed. But Apollos watered it. Well, we need to think about it as a process. And think about the fact that Jesus has just put out the help wanted sign. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Amen. Pray the Lord of the harvest will send workers out to the harvest. And we can plant. And we can water. Without the pressure of feeling like it's all on us. Because it isn't all on us. He goes ahead of us. He goes behind us. He's preparing the soil. He's preparing the conditions. He's doing all this stuff in there. And all he asks us to do is sow the seed. And to participate in the nurture. And to be, a, be there when the harvest is, it comes in. You never know. Let's look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Matthew 13, 1 through 9. This is a parable of Jesus. He said, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and a great multitude were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. 
and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good soil, good ground, and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has an ear, let him hear. You can read a lot of things into this parable, but here's what I'm, what I'm, you know, we focus a lot on the soils, and we've heard a lot of sermons about what kind of soil are you, and trying to make an individual uh, case for uh, coming to Christ and all those things. But let me tell you, I think what I also read here is that, uh, is that if, if a sower sows, he's sowing seed knowing full well that some of it's not going to germinate. Some of it's going to be picked off by the birds of the air. Some of it's going to go in the rocks. Some of it's going to go in the weeds. But he just keeps on sowing. He just keeps on sowing. He just keeps on sowing because he knows that although some of that seed is going to be hit, the place is not going to grow and it's not going to be effective. Some of that seed is going to hit some good soil. And if I just keep on sowing, eventually that seed that hits the good soil is going to produce a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. It is going to be amazing what will happen on that soil that it hits in the right place at the right time. So here's what I'm saying. You got 35,000 people who have unclaimed. What if we just started sowing seed in every way possible? And we know full well that every those, all those people aren't going to respond, but we just keep sowing the seed. Why should we do that? Because he said so. We should sow. So he said so. So so. And who knows, but so. And you never know, but so. Just keep sowing. And after a while, some of that seed, just as a matter of statistics, it is eventually going to find somebody who is responsive. And if we would do it right, we could find that some of that seed would produce 160 and 30 times over just because we were faithful to sow the seed. There's nothing wrong with the seed. It's just that sometimes it finds soil and we sh that's, that's un inhospitable, but, but we shouldn't expect everybody to respond. We don't read about that in the Word, but what we do read is that we're to witness and that the witness can be effective and that the soil that, that it finds that is, that is fertile and receptive, this seed can produce and produce in ways that are multiplying over that's why I think it's really not so much about the individual here as, you know, what kind of soil are you? But this is, has to do with the harvest. This has to do with evangelism. This has to do with casting the seed out there. And it has to do with the process. Because it doesn't happen instantly, does it? But it, it happens as a result of consistency and faithfulness and real care to the situation. And here's what's going on about the soil. Some of you uh, might recognize this in your own testimony or experience. But we are not always the same at every stage of our lives. When I was 17 years of age, even though I grew up in the church, I was in a period of rebellion. The pastor came up to me and said, Paul, how are you doing this Sunday morning? I said, God, what do you care? <laughs> I think about that all the time since I've been a pastor. <laughs> what a dumb thing to do. What do you care? I was mad. I was angry. I was doing wrong and you know I just was an unhappy guy but I was in a different place a couple years later I was receptive and broken I don't know how it is for everyone but if you want to think about this as a continuum I want you to think about this pulpit right here is the zero this is ground zero for when a person accepts Christ and here, way over here, maybe not outside the door somewhere, is, is an atheist. Doesn't want anything to do with church. And then maybe the agnostic is standing right over there. And on and on it goes. And here's a person who has kind of an awareness there must be a God. And you witness to that person at the right time. And there, say, on a scale of 1 to 10, there are maybe a minus 8. 
and you share your witness about what God's done for you, and they think there must be a God, and you say, God has answered prayer, God has helped me, let me tell you what he did, and you just share some simple thing that God has done for you, and now this guy says, you know what, that really resonates with me, and you've moved that person from an eight to a six, but he hasn't accepted Christ yet, and you go away feeling like your witness didn't mean anything, let me tell you, your witness meant something. The soil is being conditioned and being prepared, and so you go away, but somebody else comes along, and, and they don't even know you were there. They don't even have any idea. And they come along and they say, do you know anything about Jesus? He says, well, I'd like to. I, you know, I really don't. I'm kind of confused. I mean, I, and they said, you know, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus delivered me from this, that, that, and the other thing. And he says, and I just wanted you to know, I've been praying for you. I've noticed you. I've noticed that they, you seem to be searching for something. He says, how could he have known that? He said, you know, I don't know, but there might be a, there's something to this. In fact, I'm going to start reading my, I'm going to start, has anybody got a Bible I could read? Next thing you know, they're just right about here. Here, and somebody comes along and they say, uh, uh, you know, would you like to come to church with me? You wouldn't want to come to church with me. I've been dying for somebody to ask me to come. Or they might, you might say, could I talk to you a little bit? Uh, you know, we, could we get to know each other? And, and we begin to share hearts. And next thing you know, this person is just like right here. The Holy Spirit has been pulling that person all the way across here. And then they find, they find Christ. You know, it's oftentimes, it is not like it just happens. Just You don't go from out there in one step very often to right here. Maybe you, you might, but in a rare case. But most of the time, it's an emerging process. And then what happens? You accept Christ. And you begin to consolidate, recognize what happened. You begin to be discipled. You get baptized, start obeying the Lord. You find yourself a church. Next thing you know, you're out here. Next thing you know, you're a witness yourself. And now you've got a whole bunch of people. And that's, that's kind of how it works. There's a, there's a whole model for that that's called uh, the Engel uh, Spiritual Decision Process model. has been researched about how people came to, came to the Lord. People came to the Lord through a process most of the time. Maybe they, they, maybe they accepted Christ when they watched Billy Graham on television. But they were influenced by Grandma, and their friend at work had been praying for them. And somebody else from the church down the street, you know, noticed, noticed that when their lawnmower broke down on, and the grass was tall, they went ahead and just mowed their yard, uh, the front yard for them just to help them out. Or, or maybe they were recovering from the hospital from surgery and they just, uh, rather than let somebody else get their mail, they got their mail and picked up their newspaper and, and mowed their grass that week. I mean, just all kinds of things that go on. And, and all of these things are happening together. One's planting and one's watering and one's nurturing the soil. The Holy Spirit's at work and God gives the increase. And we think the only person that, that gets the credit as the evangelist is the catcher who's standing there like this. When in reality, all this stuff has been going on. This person might have less to do with it than anybody else. In fact, I have to tell you, sometimes I'm almost a little bothered by the fact, and I give this same testimony. Somebody says, I came to Christ and I don't remember a thing the preacher said. Don't remember a thing he said. Because God was all over them before they ever got there. And God was at work. And all the preaching moment was, it was an opportunity for faith to make that final click possibly. But the reality is they had been moving that direction all along. So I couldn't wait for him to get done preaching so I could go forward and get saved. Our perspective about what's going on there. Another thing, uh, the Institute of American Church Growth surveyed 14,000 laity about this. Who, what or who was responsible for you, most responsible for you coming to Christ? Who was it? 75 to 90 percent said it was because a friend or a relative influenced them. Of all the people that are out there, and we're talking about one percent, of those people, people that are going through difficult times and destabilizing situations, they're, they're, they are definitely more, more receptive. But let me tell you who else is the most receptive. The people we already know. Our own family and our own friends and our own web of relationships, that is number one, the number one resource we have. The average, Christ, the average church member has eight people that, they don't, that are in their family or close friends that don't know the Lord. And if we would work on that, and pray for them, and make sure we witness for them, that e eventually we would find ourselves encroaching on that number. That's where the best opportunities are. It is more difficult to make a cold call than it is to make a call on somebody who would be delighted to see you at their door. 
you know, the old idea of just knocking on doors randomly and, and saying, hi, I'm from the church or something like that. Uh, you know, it's really pretty much gone. I'm not saying it wouldn't occasionally work, but because of some of the groups that go around and do that a lot and because of the changes in our society, that doesn't work very well. It might have worked in, the, in, a, in a different time when people felt safer. But there are people who would love a telephone call from you, would love your interest in friendship, would love you to take, to take just an interest. And it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, over, you know uh, over the top, but just to show some interest. I had lunch with Harmon Schmelzenbaugh the third one time. That's not to my credit. He had him at our church for a missionary convention. I was taking him to the airport. I said, Harmon, the growth rate in Africa is astounding. What, how, what is it? What method do you use that makes all that difference? And he said, it's really very simple. We focus on the web of personal relationships, family, relatives, and friends of the people we have, and it gives us more than enough. And that is how we have this exponential growth going on in Africa. So that the target is, 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 is people in need and people that we know, and then you know, we can move out. We want to witness to everybody and everybody as much as we can, but it's more likely to be harder soil out there the further we move out from that. So we look for those relationships and we pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers. And as Martin Luther said, if you're going to pray for the Lord to call and send workers, plan on praying it with a hoe in your hand. <laughs> because the chances are real good that you are the one or one of the ones he will, he will call. We are driven... Uh, to do this uh, or call to do this because God loves us and God's changed us and we, we want him to uh, be Lord and, and we want to help people. But the thing is, the harvest is short. Don't we live in some pretty desperate times? And how long do we have? If we thought, if we knew that we only had one year, five years, six months, what would we do to try to witness to people? And the reality is, we just really don't know. But we live in a world that is destabilized and hungry, but has a veneer and a surface toughness that wants to say, I don't need that. But in reality, people are scared. What would it take for that to happen to have 500 in five years, 1%? reach like that it would take a red hot revived church it would take an engaged congregation that that realizes that we are all part of this it would take people that would realize that we don't have to have we don't have to be the the arm or the leg the eyeball or the foot we can be part of the body and we don't have to be the one to har bring in the harvest for the to be a part of the harvesting we just sow and we just follow the Lord and show compassion and go where he wants us to go. And if you didn't do anything else, just sow. Just keep on sowing. You never know. Surely it may hit all these other things. But if you sow enough, it's bound to hit some tender heart and find that it takes root. And you might see it in a week or a month or a season, or it might happen when you're in heaven and somebody, else, somebody responds, but there is a harvest, 160 and 30 times. Do you believe that? That's what the Bible says. My, 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 have I seen that kind of growth in my ministry? I have not. I've seen strong growth, really strong growth. I mean, I've seen some really strong growth, but not that much in five years. But I don't think I've begun to see what God can do. I've read the book. And it can't be possible that in the book of Acts that thousands could come in in a day, but it would be impossible for us to expect 1% over five years if we're talking about the same Holy Spirit that's in the Bible. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send out workers into the harvest field. The harvest is abundant and plentiful. The workers are few. Father, thank you for speaking to us tonight, for speaking to me. And Lord, perhaps this is the beginning of a vision for this 
church's future that would bring us into a whole new realm of either being a church that uh, has had great growth here or is able of just to plant a church or to be a part of something lord that makes a huge difference we're not really concerned about that this moment we are concerned about the fact there's 35,000 people who are totally unclaimed and lord also we know frankly that even among those who are claimed many of those are claimed but they are not really viable disciples so lord help us to catch the vision for witnessing to this community Help me to lead these people and help us to respond to the leadership of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Are you with me?